Welcome everyone to the final day of the spring 2021 Martin Gardner Celebration of Mind Talks. I am very pleased and honored to be able to introduce Marjorie Wickler Seneschal. Um, many of you who've gone to Gardner are probably familiar with Marjorie as the longtime editor of Mathematical Intelligencer. She's the author editor of a number of wonderful books and a recipient of many awards. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to her talk today. It looks like an incredibly fascinating topic. So with that, Marjorie, uh, you're welcome to begin. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> thank you very, very much. And thank you for inviting me. And I'm very pleased to join everybody. There's a wonderful community, the Gardner Group. You'll see what the gem is as we go along here. I hope, uh, I think it's a gem. And uh, I just want again to say thank you for inviting me to do this. The things I'm talking about today are things I only just learned recently. And I have a feeling that many of you know about them and uh, can help me understand them better. Um, so if, in that case, please do get in touch. I'll, I'll give you my email at the end of this. Uh, but I want to show you something, what I did find out, and uh, I think about the Archimedean polyhedra, which I think is interesting and some of its consequences. So this is the abstract that I sent in, a little bit modified. Uh, if the celebrated Scottish zoologist uh, Darcy Thompson uh, could meet the near legendary German astronomer Johannes Kepler, what would they talk about? And I suggest that Thompson would proudly show Kepler the insightful cardboard models of the Archimedean polyhedra that he made for the ICM meeting in Toronto, 1924. Uh, what was his insight and what became of it? You might also wonder why was he doing this, being a zoologist? Um, but he was interested in everything, and so was Kepler, and so that may be the answer, but then there's more to it too. So you know who Kepler was, but who was Darcy Thompson? This is going to be in three parts, and these are the three parts, but we'll start with who was Darcy Thompson. Uh, he was, as I said, a Scottish zoologist. He was born in Edinburgh in 1860, and he first planned to study medicine, uh, but then he changed his mind, and he went to Cambridge and got his BA in Natural Sciences and then became professor of biology at the University of Dundee in Scotland. And uh, from there on, he became better and better known for his um, study of living forms, uh, all kinds of living forms. And uh, then he went on expeditions around the world. And uh, finally, in 1917, he published his masterpiece called a uh, big book called On Growth and Form. And we'll spend some time with that. Um, and then at that same year, he was made chair of natural history at St. Andrews University and awarded a knighthood in, uh, 20 years after that. And then he died in St. Andrews in 1948. This is a picture of him with his youngest daughter. He had three. Uh, what did he look like? This is a picture of, of Darcy Thompson. I don't know what year it was taken in, uh, but it is with him. And the thing to notice here is the parrot. Uh, because he never went anywhere apparently without this parrot, and everybody in uh, in Dundee knew knew him when they saw him walking down the street because he had a parrot on his shoulder all the time. Um, this is the present zoology museum in, in his name. These are all the things he collected. This is just one one small part of it. It's an enormous museum, and it's a magnificent resource uh, of studying the forms of animals. And uh, he had all kinds of things in there. And this is a cartoon of him. Um, that I just got off the internet with uh, his parrot <laughs> looming large on his hand, but also many of the creatures that he had uh, studied and studied their forms. And here is uh, his book, Growth and Form, and uh, then his books, the Classical Greek. He was a classicist. He was a biologist, as I said, a zoologist. Um, he was a linguist. He knew many languages, and he uh, was interested in mathematics very deeply, although he was not a mathematician and very much aware that he wasn't, but he tried to encourage mathematicians to get involved he, into what we would now call mathematical biology today, although it's not in the form that he quite thought it would become, but nevertheless. So here are his books. He wrote about uh, the Greek fishes, the Greek birds, um, studied Aristotle's classification of animals. Anyway, I won't go through all that, but he was quite a, a very diverse person interested in so many different things. Um, here's a picture of him that hangs in the uh, University of Dundee in the hall. Uh, it's a portrait of him. I don't know yet what year, but it must have been somewhere you know, in the 1920s or so, certainly after Growth and Form was published. And this is the copy of the book that I have. Uh, it's 700 and something pages. Um, and what's in it? This is the contents, table of contents. And you can see 
These are all things having to do with the growth and form of living things. So rate of growth, internal form and structure of cells, the forms of cells. This may be where his interest in polyhedra came. Uh, and then on forms of tissues and cell aggregates. So this is, we would think of as an introduction to tilings in a sense. Um, and then concretions and spicules. And as you see, uh, spirals and spiral shells and horns and teeth and phallotaxis and eggs and every anything that had to do with the sh with shape of living things he was interested in um and my the copy that i showed you of the book it belongs to me now because it was given to me by uh, a person who was very important in my own development as a, as a mathematician in crystallography the dorothy wrench and we'll talk a little bit more about her toward the end uh she was shown here with her students at smith college and this was about 1965 before I knew her, but that's what she looked like when I did know her. And uh, she uh, she had been uh, uh, not a student of, of Darcy Thompson, but he was her mentor and her friend and her inspiration. Um, and here are a few quotes from him and pictures from his book, Growth and Form. Um, this is a splash, this is radiolarian, this is a shell, spiral shell. Um, here's, this is the, the um, what he's most famous for from this book is his suggestion that uh, different fish, which look very different to us, actually can be looked at as just being uh, transformations of the other by a grid, uh, one another by a grid. And this, uh, whether there's anything to this in terms of how things actually do form or just just a descriptive picture is a different question, but it was very insightful and people were very excited about it. And he, throughout the book, he pressed uh, that so many things of these things about form could be understood by physics and chemistry and math, rather than having to find all kinds of other explanations for it. Um, and um, so this was actually much more controversial than we would think it is, because at the time, uh, this was a time of great enthusiasm of Darwinism, and people argued that every single thing uh, uh, about the form and so on would have to have something to do with survival of the fittest. And he felt that we didn't have to go that far, that right, just looking at the math and the physics and chemistry could tell us a lot. Um, <clears throat> here's, here, this is one of my favorite quotes from the book. It says, while I've thought to show the naturalist how a few mathematical concepts and dynamical principles may help and guide him, I've tried to show the mathematician a field for his labor, a field which few have entered and no man has explored. And he was, he didn't find many mathematicians who were willing to uh, take this up, but he did find a couple. The book was, uh, it's had a curious uh, history. It, it, it's been praised to the skies as a fine work of literature, which it certainly is. And if you read it, you find it's hard to put down. It's so interesting. And uh, so here are some of the praises for it. Finest work of literature and all the annals of science that have been recorded in the English tongue. You, you can't go better than that or one of the two or three most brilliant and original books in the life sciences, which this century, that's the last century, has seen or is likely to see, that's quite something too. Uh, but in terms of its influence on biology and on mathematical biology in particular, it has not been so great. Uh, and apparently most biologists have never heard of it and most working biologists today, which shows that 100 years later, it hasn't really been had the impact that, uh, that the people at the time thought it would. Uh, and mathematical biology does not go in the directions that he uh, was hoping either. Uh, nevertheless, it's a book that's still full of insights and full of interesting things and worth reading. Um, the Centenary, and uh, he, the book was published in 1917 and 2017. There were celebrations around the world uh, in various quarters, but not necessarily mathematics. Uh, but some we did the intelligence or we had a special issue in honor of it. But it, what we had there was talks, uh, the texts of talks, some talks given um, at a celebration at the University of Dundee and St. Andrews. And uh, this is a page from the book here. And here was a t uh, conference held in New York on uh, his influence in art design and architecture. And this is just two of the things that are, we're trying to reflect on it after 100 years. I was at both of those celebrations and I wrote things for them for, for various uh, publications. And then after all that, I found this abstract um, online. I don't remember how I came across it. Uh, for the 1924 International Congress of Mathematicians in Toronto, which he attended. Uh, and it's the title of it is The Repeating Patterns of the Regular Polygons and Their Relations to the Archimedean Bodies. 
And I thought, that's odd. Uh, what's in here? And I read it and uh, I won't, I'll show you what he's talking about. I don't want to try to read the small pr print here and take a lot of time, but I'll show you what he's talking about doing there. Uh, but anyway, I was very interested. I tried to get in touch, find out more of the pandemic had closed the archives, but the archivists uh, at St. Andrews and uh, at the University of Dundee both were wonderfully helpful to me and helped me dig things up. And I want to thank them publicly for that. So what was he talking about here? Uh, why was he interested in the Archimedean polyhedra? First place. This is Archimedes here with his famous shout Eureka when he discovered. So this is part of why was Dar Darcy Thompson interested in the Archimedean polyhedra. Uh, also at that conference in Dundee was Stephen Wolfram and he wrote up some things. He took notes and took pictures and of things in the archives. That was when the archives were still open and uh, put them on his blog. So I'm just showing you here a page from his blog afterwards. Um, in which he wrote, in the study of shapes of biological cells, Darcy had gotten interested in polyhedra and packings. And I think that is exactly what he was interested in. He thought, I think so too, that he would just uh, figure that the uh, shapes of the things that pack should be of interest and they probably have high symmetry and that's why they would be the Archimedean solids. Uh, and, uh, and Stephen went on to say his archives contain all sorts of investigations of possible packings and their properties uh, and uh, models of with actual carbon polyhedra still ready to assemble and these are just some pictures that he took there but he didn't talk about what i found in uh, uh <clears throat> yeah about the uh, that abstract and the paper that he wrote after that 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 is not in here so first of all let's before we say anything more let's remember what the archimedean solids are <clears throat> and this i took from george hart's um website the archimedean solids are convex polyhedra so there are, leave out the star polyhedra and so forth. Uh, convex polyhedra composed of regular polygons, and then I've added in this of two or more different types, because if you don't, then you get the regular polyhedra too. Uh, two or more different types, so here you have squares and triangles, here you have uh, hexagons, I guess octagons, squares, and so forth and so on. You see they're all two, two or more types, such that every vertex is equivalent to every other vertex, so that it's, uh, transitive on the vertices and any vertex you pick is exactly the same as, as any other and also you can mo go by some symmetry operation from one to any one to any other. So those are the Archimedean solids and uh, they were found by Archimedes which is why they're called Archimedean um, but then rediscovered throughout the Renaissance by different people and finally uh, a full good account of them was given by Kepler uh, in his book on the harmony of the world um, because he was interested in uh, regular tilings and in the, I mean, semi-regular tilings and semi-regular polyhedra too. Uh, he said the, the uh, architect of f regular figures, congruent figures in the plane and in the solids. And of his book, The Harmony of the World, he had five parts and the second part is the one that we're talking about here. And this is our friend Kepler. Um, and so here is his drawing, Kepler's drawing of the uh, regular congruent polyhedra uh, uh, figures in the plane. As you're all familiar with this, I'm sure. And here, are the these are many of these, but not all can be extended to tilings of the plane. And this is what he showed. Um, and he gave them all peculiar letters. Um, and um, there we have it. This is the very famous to everybody who's been interested in Penrose tiling because this can be uh, shown to be directly related to that. Although Kepler didn't see how to extend that. Uh, some of these can be extended, I said, to cover the plane, not all of them. Um, so that was his Kepler's drawing of these figures in the plane. And then here are his pictures of the solids. Um, and these are the known as the Archimedean bodies, which is what he called them, too. Uh, there are 13 of them. And he gave these he numbered normally, uh, one, to, 1 through 13. And then this is Darcy Thompson's remark on this. He said the Archimedean bodies... Uh, may be derived by truncation from the regular solids by slicing off corners or edges and so on. Though in two cases, uh, and the so-called snub cube and snub dodecahedra, and these two here, uh, no, uh, I can't see underneath the screen here, but no simple method or straightforward method exists for performing this operation. Uh, and then he adds, Thompson adds, that the method of truncation was in Kepler's mind is plain from the names which he gives to these bodies. Most of them are the truncated this and the truncated that. Uh, these he called, however, the snub this and snub that, snub cube and snub dodecahedron. Uh, and so Thompson was, was found it interesting that he couldn't, that Kepler had not been able to get these by truncation, but he found them anyway. But then 
as I said, Thompson was was a he wasn't a mathematician, but he was very widely read in mathematics, and he also knew that Catalan had uh, also enumerated and, uh, and constructed the Archimedean polyhedra, and he'd done it in another different way, and he'd done it in spherical trigonometry, um, was inscribing these on the on the surface of a sphere, and then Thompson noted to his curiosity, found it curious that Catalan found the same two polyhedra again presenting considerable difficulty. So what was going, what made these so hard? And he found it odd that, you know, they had to have two different categories, those you can make the way they want, construct them the way they want to, and then these extra two. I should point out, um, before I forget to do that, is that uh, there were two problems here that Thompson was interested in. One is the enumeration. So uh, how many are there? How do, you, how do you make a list of them? The other is how do you actually make them? and build them. And so the one, the Kepler's way was to take the regular solids and cut off the corners, uh, give them nose jobs. And then the Catalan's way was to use spherical trigonometry and show how they could be inscribed in a, in a, in a sphere. Uh, but either way that you do it, he found these two, two uh, having the same problems. Now, then he had found another way. And this is what he was so excited about. There remained the third way of constructing <clears throat> regarding or constructing Archimedean bodies, and this is the theme of the present note, and that's the what I found the abstract of. And here's what he says: He take any one of the plane repeating patterns, or continuous symmetrical assemblages of the regular polygons. So take any one of those plane tilings, as enumerated by Kepler, as for example a continuous sheet of hexagons. So imagine this going on forever. Um, remove alternate hexagons in this case. Uh, in this case of this particular tiling. So here you see I'm removing alternate uh, so as to leave symmetrically arranged holes, fenestri. So here uh, we have a ring and this is cut out. And then the, we continue this. And so the whole thing becomes a pattern of uh, cut out hexagons, uh, each surrounded by a symmetrical ring of hexagons. And then he says, suppose each ring to be slit. Um, so you here you have this, this cut out. Now you look at its ring and now you make a slit and then you can make uh, the Archimedean polyhedra, three of them this way. And this is what he, he had discovered. He was very excited about it. So here's my picture of it. Here's that same hole. And here I've just shown just these that are the, um, the ones surrounding it, although they continue on this forever. Um, and now we're going to slit this here and now pull it over around. So you see I've done that, begun to pull this this way and then pulling a little further and clipping with paper clip, you see that this is turning into a pentagon. And when I pull it all the way over, since these edge, edge lengths are the same, this becomes uh, a, a pe pentagon surrounded by hexagons. And um, that's one of the arrangements that you find in, the, in one of the Archimedean polyhedra. You take it a little further, pull further, and we can lap it. So this is the same setup, except that I'm now, instead of clipping it here, pulling it a little further, I get this one. Uh, now I have a square, and or he has a square. This was his idea. And then go another one, and we end up with a uh, triangle in the middle, surrounded by hexagons. And so this is... These are all, these are three, give us three of the Archimedean polyhedra this way. And he uh, told, he reported that in 1922 to the Royal Society. And then he discovered that he could get all the Archimedean polyhedra in a similar way using the different plane tilings. I'll just show you this one. This is what I just showed you before, but I did it with uh, some of my plastic toys. Um, these, think of the, this one is empty and this is, this, these are not. Uh, but now, see, I'm pulling over this way. I pull further and I can clip this onto that and now I have a very nice pentagon here and I have a uh, hex surrounded by hexagons and this is the uh, this is Kepler's number four this is the uh, Archimedean polyhedron that where this corresponds to and then you can go one step further like I showed you before uh, that now I'm making uh, squares by pulling it around once more and then another time yet uh, I pull it and get the triangles and that becomes this one whereas this one was this one. This was, it's a little bit awkward uh, because they don't really fit together anymore because this is real plastic and not just abstract lines. So I had to clip it with this, but nevertheless, you see what I mean here. Uh, and you don't have, with, you can do the same thing with the squares, uh, with, the, with a um, pattern of tiling of squares. Again, 
cut out the holes, uh, cut out a, a, uh, the rectangles that I've shaded here so that each one is surrounded by a, a ring of rectangles, and then slit the ring, and then uh, pull and twist, and you get this. This is what I did with paper, and this is what uh, this is the Archimedean saw that corresponds to that. Now the thing here is that you once you cut one, get one triangle by pulling and sliding, you have to do the next one to the next one to the next one if you want it to end up rolling and folding itself onto a sphere, which is what it's supposed to do. So his idea is that this plane uh, is then put, made, mapped onto the sphere in this way and we get uh, the Archimedean solids that way. Um, and here's my doing this with uh, my toys. Uh, and this is why he was so excited, is that the snub cube and the snub dodecahedron, which as we've seen are not easy to produce either by truncation of a regular solid or by partition of the sphere, are developed according to our method in as, in as simple a fashion as any of the rest. Because there are two uh, tilings of the plane that uh, have hexagons surrounded by triangles in this way. I mean, there's one that, I'm sorry, just one that has hexagons with triangles, but these can be made into two different, the two different snubs by either going twisting once around and getting pentagons or twice around and getting squares. And so you can see that both this one arrangement gives both of these and uh, it's, just, it's just a straightforward application of the idea that he had been, he had discovered the hexagons and the squares. Uh, here is Darcy Thompson with his Eureka moment. He was extremely excited about this and this is what he, he wrote up and he talked about in the Toronto meeting. Um, and this is just my drawing of, to show how some, I, this isn't complete, but this shows how some of these um, <clears throat> Archimedean solids connect to the plane tilings. And maybe maybe you all know this, or some of you know this and, and have worked with it, and I would love to hear about that. I hadn't seen it anywhere before. And here is, here is a list of the polyhedron number and the tiling letter so that you can see that every one of them, every one of these is obtained from one of these. And uh, Thompson remarks on this, what we've done is apparently to impart a definite amount of curvature to a portion of our plane sheet, and then to go on applying the same amount of curvature to equally and symmetrically interspaced portions of the same sheet, and a total curvature is therefore essentially spherical. Uh, and he thinks this is somehow related to group theory, but he doesn't know. Um, the group theory was in its infancy at that time, and he thought there was some connection there, but he didn't know what it was. Um, now, the um, at St. Andrews University, um, the archivist had had students go through his papers and letters and things and make quick, brief summaries of what they said, and she shared with those with me because the archives are closed and there wasn't it was a difficult she couldn't herself go there, but she had these notes, and here are two notes which uh, talk give us a sense of the reception that this idea of his perceive, uh, received at the time, and, and these are people who knew him. Uh, and one of them says that Thompson hasn't the patience to make a paper model. So in other words, he didn't take it any further than what I showed you. Uh, he, but he just said the enclosed scrap is enough to show how it goes, and that's all you need. Uh, and I wonder about that. But anyway, uh, a proper model of cardboard hexagons with tape hinges is a very pretty thing. Yes, it is. And you clip together the overlapping hexagons with paper clips. And then somebody else on another, uh, another note wrote that... Uh, that uh, Bennett has returned Thompson's paper on the Archimedean Solids to the Royal Society three or four weeks ago, along with his report on it. He expects they will want heavy cuts. He deems Thompson's central idea of the sheet manipulation a curiosity and very difficult to appraise. So that was the reception that this got. And then another note says that he discusses the new edition of Growth and Form, because he was preparing a second edition, saying he would have to write a chapter on the theory of polyhedra. Uh, he said that that was a note in 1923. The book was, the re revised book was published in 1942. It took 20 years, uh, 300 pages longer than the first one, and there's no chapter on polyhedra in there. So what, I guess he just gave up on this or whatever. The, the, the second edition has uh, got a lot of other things in it. Uh, so he never did anything with that. So now then I just want to um, get, give you epilogue. This I just realized a few days ago, actually. It's a curious footnote in the history of science, and I'll explain to you what this is in a minute. Uh, so Darcy Thompson influenced a broad spectrum of scientists and artists he never met, uh, but arguably, arguably none more deeply than one he knew very well, 
uh, polymathic, polyhedral, polycontroversial, Dorothy Maud Wren. She's the person I showed you the picture of at the very beginning. Uh, she later, she was British, um, but she emigrated to the United States at the time of the Second World War and was teaching at Smith College when I began teaching there, and that's how I knew her. So she was very unfocused. She was brilliant and had published papers in many different areas of mathematics, applied and uh, logic and so on, but she was completely unfocused. Um, and she first met Darcy Thompson in 1918 at a conference in, in Britain where they both lived. And he urged her to apply her talents and insights to the problem of biological form. And she did. This became her life goal, except that she was interested, she focused, she really got focused, and not just biological form in general, but in particular the structure of protein molecules. And they were very good friends. Um, they became very good friends, I should say. Their correspondence between them is rich. It goes on from the time of 1918 when they first met up to 1948 when he died. This is just one quick one that I just took uh, the, because uh, Darcy Thompson, as I said, went to Toronto for the meeting of the ICM and she was supposed to go but she couldn't because her husband had had a very serious accident and so he wrote, my dear Dorothy Wrench, we were disappointed you did not come to Toronto and so on. Uh, for time I won't read, read on, but their correspondence is, is very interesting. Um, um, Dorothy got interested in, um, as I said, in protein structure. She uh, applied to the Rockefeller Foundation, which was urging mathematicians and biologists, physicists to study biological problems too. And this was just at the time that proteins were realized that they were molecules. They thought before they were colloids, but that they actually had a structure. But nobody had ever found the structure of them. Uh, and this was before Pauling's book on the nature of the chemical bond. And so this is to give you a, sort of a timeline of where things stood at that time. And she received a five-year Rockefeller Foundation grant to apply mathematics to chromosome structure. Um, but her model for chromosomes didn't work out, so she changed to, to proteins. And she devised the first model for protein structure that would, anyone had ever proposed, and it galvanized the nascent field. Um, what she proposed was this. She proposed that protein chains uh, fold into rings. So this is the chain, and it loops itself into hexagonal rings. Um, that loop themselves into hexagonal patterns that then join to form fabrics. And this was her idea of what she called the protein fabric. She called it a cyclol. And she first proposed that these stack in layers. So the protein is, is really, I don't know how to describe it, but it's, it's got this fabric uh, with hexagonal fabric and then another one on top of it, another one on top of it. Uh, but she, her, the chemist that she discusses with told her that that wouldn't work uh, for chemical reasons. So she decided to make a 3D model instead. And this is a picture of her 3D model. And that was my eureka moment uh, while, while preparing this talk. I remembered that I wrote a biography of Wrench uh, in 2013, and this is a, one, one thing in it that I wrote. On one of his visits to Oxford, Dorothy met with Warren Weaver of the Rockefeller Foundation. And in his diary in 1936, he, he noted that she showed him various nets of hexagons, pentagons, etc., which could cover a sphere with a singular point, without a singular point, sorry. She has somewhat vague but interesting idea for the development of a new branch of mathematics she wishes to call discrete topology. Um, and uh, then he goes on to say he tried to get her to be more definite and consider its relation to group theory and so on. The, he doesn't say, and she never said anywhere else, what this was about, and I didn't know when I wrote the book, what this was about, but I thought it was interesting and I just put this in there since it's in the Rockefeller archives. Uh, but now it suddenly dawned on me uh, that she's talking about Darcy Thompson's ideas here, uh, about folding uh, folding a sheet of, of a tiled sheet around, around a sphere. Uh, and so, in other words, that this looks to me now very much like this. And I think not only might she have been thinking of this, I'm sure she was. She knew him well. She would have definitely read this book, the, his papers. They would have probably talked about it, but this, there's no way she wasn't aware of this. And this looks so much like this. And this was to fold up and to make a 3D model, and that's exactly what she did with this. Um, and it hit the headlines of the scientific world, her model. It was a big um, a point of controversy. Many people were, scientists were thought it was fantastic. Uh, and others thought it was just ridiculous. And uh, she was in the middle of a of conflict, and that's basically what my book is about, and I won't go into any of that here, except that this wonderful picture, Woman Einstein, Dr. Rinch, 
solves biological problems mathematically. And um, th that's a great headline. And then it goes on to say that she's uh, driving force behind her studies. That's a quote from here. Has been a strong conviction that patterns in nature are extremely important and mathematics are necessary, to are, that's plural, uh, necessary to studying patterns. And when I met her, she was, symmetry was her thing and symmetrical patterns and so on. That's how I got interested in that was through her. Um, the, this is a, uh, uh, th this is her her model. Um, Niels Bohr was one of her supporters, and he had models made in his laboratory. And so this is one of them. If you can see it right here, can you see? I've got it right here. This is the very same one. Um, and uh, this here uh, is a truncated tetrahedron made by Steubenglass. It's an absolutely beautiful thing, which um, which was a gift to me from David and Deborah Harker, who I'll mention to them in just a minute, uh, uh, David Harker. Anyway, this is the, this because this is the same, same shape. This is triangles and hexagons. The hexa hexagons aren't regular hexagons. They're very, very small little uh, corners here cut off, but they are hexagons and triangles, and this is the same. This is the Archimedean. Uh, but it turned out that the model was wrong. These proteins are not cage-like. So that was the end of that, sort of. Uh, but David Harker noted at a conference we had here in her memory it was a noble attempt and it might have been right. And her value to me, to all of us, is that her, her hypothesis produced so much interest in the structure of proteins that now, about 40 years later, and that was 1980, that's 40 years ago, there are close to 100 structures known. And I checked this on Google a couple of days ago and found that now there are 1,707 and nine protein structures known. And, and as he felt that anybody who could get the field going like that deserves our thanks. Uh, so there's a moral of the story here is that a wrong idea can be stimulating and productive. And we should be very careful not to just discard things, but to think about what they might imply, even if they're wrong. And that is certainly the story here. Uh, Darcy Thompson's method of getting the Archimedean polyhedra may not have had anything to do with uh, certainly why he would have been interested in them, the form and structure of animals, of still cells and tissues. And they certainly don't have much to do with polyhedra, with uh, proteins either, but they did galvanize the field entirely. Um, so I want to end uh, just with Darcy Thompson's idea again, going back to it. Um, he, there's, it's, it gets a little fishy uh, in a sense, because he, you cut out the one, one uh, hexagon and then you wrap, twist around and you get, get pentagon of hexagon surrounding the pentagon but you have to do this again for the next pentagon and the next one the next one he didn't say how you slit the, the other rings uh is there any particular order in which you slit them it how do you go about doing this you have you're taking an infinite sheet and you're supposed to be wrapping it around a sphere and uh it, there's no theory there that i know no algorithm there uh he's he he wrote and i uh in there whereas jordan who with the uh group theory trace the correlated movements of a rigid system and the whole movement therefore leaves the system unchanged. In our case, every point travels by a definite pathway. He didn't say what that definite pathway is. To a definite point, well, yes, sort of, but in an entirely different but still symmetrical configuration. What is, what's going on here? I think it's an interesting question. And um, maybe some of you know this already, and maybe it may be people, some of you will be interested in exploring it if you don't know. Uh, and it could be it could be quite a, um, a maybe a, a fertile direction to uh, to try. I've tried to make one, several things. I I tried. This is my my first version of or second or third version of making one of those with the pentagons and the hexagons around it. And after a while, I gave up and just began collapsing on me. Partly because I didn't know which where to slit the rings. Um, I don't think that. It, anyway, I won't say what I did wrong, but it's a, after a while everything was wrong, and I left it at this. But I think there it could be put into some feasible and sensible um, me method, and it would be very interesting. So please, if you if you p go on with this or you know more about it, please let me know, and I'd love to hear from you. And um, that's it. I think what I wanted to say. I, references uh, are two references, namely is his paper. This is the one that the uh, archivist found for me on the 13 semi-regular. This was, I had seen the abstract, as I told you, and this was the paper itself. 
<clears throat> the 13 semi-regular solids of Archimedes and the development of the trans by the transformation of certain plane configurations by Darcy Thompson. And then the other things are all in my book there. So thank you very much, Marjorie. That was uh, that was delightful. Some amazing uh, connections you've discovered there. And um, thank you very much. Well, so you. we do have a couple of questions here. Get rid of my cat here. <laughs> I've got a few there that I wander around too. Yes. Okay. Comments. It might be interesting to pull back symmetric colorings of the Archimedean solids to the tilings Darcy Thompson used to generate them. Hmm. Yeah, I don't, until we can get into the archives, it's a little hard to, to uh, think about that, but that's something I definitely would like to do once they reopen again, to look and see what he actually had there. Yeah. And uh, I wonder if anyone has taken that spherical truncated icosahedron pattern with the missing pentagons and unwrapped it to see which hexagons are used. Yeah, that's sort of doing this in, invertedly. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, this is all very new to me. And there's lots and lots of, of things to try. Frank Ferris says, I wonder if the missing hexagons method could be systematized using the Eisenstein integers. That seems like a reasonable idea. Yeah, I think that would be the great thing to try. Please do. So Doris says, I wonder if the slits could be related to certain ways to produce a flat net from a solid. It should be. Um, you mean to sort of unwrap these and get a flat net. And I, I tried a few of those things, tried that a little bit, and then I gave up and nothing was coming clear to me, but that doesn't mean it wouldn't work at all. And that would be very interesting. The picture that Stephen Wolfram had in, in his blog that I put on the screen um, did look like an unfolded net of, of something. And uh, that may, may be some connection to it, but I'm not sure. I'm not really sure what he had photographed there. I'm not, uh, again, when the archives open, then we can really go in and see what's, well, what Darcy Thompson actually did. And, mm -hmm. Okay, for the snubs, it should be noted that there are left and right-handed versions and uh, comment, it was good that you used yellow and green plastic pieces to illustrate this. <laughs> okay, Adam Atkinson says, I only learned fairly recently of a sort of 14th Archimedean solid, the pseudo rhombocuboctahedron, which qualifies or doesn't according to as exactly how you define these things. It is generally felt that the definition should be tweaked. Is it generally felt that the definition should be tweaked to include it or exclude it? Do you, do you have an opinion on that? No, I don't. Okay. Because I don't know enough about it, but it's, it's definitely something to think about. It occurs to me that many more polyhedra might be uh, obtainable. The, the uh, so-called Archimedean tilings, uh, which mm -hmm. are defined equivalently, which Kepler had them, uh, there are 11 of those. And I think uh, three of them are not used uh, in this. Be, we're not used to create these polyhedra because they don't have those rings around uh, around a central uh, poly polygon. Uh, but that doesn't mean that something couldn't be done with them. And Darcy Thompson himself took the regular, the net of uh, regular equilateral triangles and showed how you could, by not using rings, but just using slits up to vertices, you could uh, get the uh, tetrahedron, the octahedron, uh, the icosahedron, um, but not the, not the dodecahedron. So there may be with these other tilings there, possibilities of getting things that just aren't the Archimedean. He was only interested in those. And yeah. 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 I think that'd be very interesting. There may be a whole lot more things here. Yeah. Yeah. So Calm says, going off on a tangent, have the higher dimensional analogs of Archimedean solids been determined, say 4D and 5D? I'm pretty sure the answer is yes there. I don't know what the combinatorics are with that. Yeah, I don't either. But it'd be interesting to see if there's a 3D tessellation that would, <laughs> a space that would fold up into one of those, <laughs> into a four dimensional. Oh, wow. Uh, that would be yeah. fun. Uh, Frank Morgan mentions that uh, Thompson especially loved the truncated oct octahedron, which he famously conjectured provide, provided the least surface area way to divide space into unit volumes, a conjecture which still remains unsolved 100 years later. Hmm. You know, it's fascinating to me how much he knew about so many things. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was really uh, very much up to date. I mean, for a, zo a zoologist in Scotland to know about the group theory. Um, and to speculate about possible relations to that, uh, it's, that's quite, uh, it's quite remarkable. And there were many fields in which he had, he just, he was a, a real polymath in the very best sense. Uh, I should just want to add one thing to add though. He was often criticized for being unfocused too. And he and Dorothy Wrench shared 
that. Mm -hmm. The tendency to go off in all directions and when everything interesting came, came along. George Hart mentions there's 43,380 nets of an icosahedron, okay? Wow. And I think they each correspond to an open unfolding of the truncated icosahedron. Wow. Wow. How do they differ? What's the differences among these, all these many? I have to ask George that. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, thank you once again, Marjorie. We're very fortunate and uh, to have you here. And uh, it was a delightful talk. Thank you everyone for attending.